we are live. Hi, welcome everyone for this special session of Medi Scholarship Paper Discussion. And in the following 50 minutes, you will hear from four speakers presenting their paper research. And it will be Anan Kan, Chilvan, Leah, and Charlotte. Please take it away. Anan, you can start. And you have about 12 minutes, and I'll give you a two minute um, sign uh, through the chat and the next speaker can come on. Yeah, I just shared my screen. Is the presentation visible? We can't see your uh, your screen. It's entirely blocked. Do you want to try sharing it again? Am I, is it visible now? Oh, yeah. yep, it's good, good. Great. Uh, hi everyone, I am Anam. I'm a PhD student from Dalhousie University. Uh, why do I hear another audio? Hi, am I still audible? Yeah, I'm so sorry. The conference was running in the background, so I got a bit confused. So I'm going to just start again. I am Anam, I'm a PhD student, and I'll be presenting my paper titled The Paradox of Trauma. Can experiencing trauma in childhood strengthen one's ability to endure adversity in young adulthood? So many of us might already be familiar with the concept of resilience, which is analogous to the property of a spring to resume its shape after being stretched. Psychological resilience enables us to bounce back from significant adversity. Now, during the early years of resilience research, Michael Rutter observed that intermittent exposure to brief periods of stress can actually increase our resistance to later stressors. He termed this concept as the stealing effect, which is also known as stress inoculation, hardiness, mental toughness, etc. To explain this phenomena, he drew parallel with how we develop resistance to infections. So immunity to infections does not come about through daily living. It comes about when we encounter infections and, for example, how we are dealing with COVID-19 right now. So when we have the experience of successfully overcoming infections, either through immunization, which we are doing right now, or through infections that arise in the ordinary course of events. So there were a lot of animal studies that were done initially to explain stealing effect. And then there were a lot of human studies. So one of the earliest evidences for stealing effect in human comes from elder study, which was conducted in 1974. And this was uh, done on the children which were living during the Great Depression. Although the study was not originally designed to study stealing effect, Elder found that older children compared to younger children who had more responsibilities were better at emotional and psychological functioning in the long run because of all the responsibilities that they had to take as compared to the younger children who could not cope as well. Another evidence come from Peterson and colleagues who found evidence of enhanced character strengths among those who have suffered trauma. Now, one of the most extensive uh, evidences to support stealing effect come from Siri et al. study, who discusses the role of adversity in building resilience and reported that individuals with a history of uh, some lifetime adversity reported better mental health and well being outcomes. So, coming to the present study, Although the concept of stealing effect is well known among researchers, there has not been a lot of research which explores different contexts of resilience. Now, the, some research has found that childhood may be a particularly important time for the development of stealing effect. Also, interview-based methodologies might be a good way to study stealing effect because of the subjective nature of adverse experiences because adversity can be subjective in nature and also because of the subjective nature of resilience. So this paper was is presents evidence of stealing effect among adults with a history of childhood adversity. 
coming on to the methodology, this paper was actually part of a larger investigation of childhood adversity. And the participants, we had 1,040 participants who were screened for presence of adversity in childhood and resilience in adulthood. And out of these 50 individuals were interviewed uh, using McAdams 2012 life story approach. So they were interviewed to know about their childhood trauma, about resilience, and about the noticeable uh, achievements in their life, which could be personal and professional achievements. Then the interviews were analyzed using Broad and Clark's thematic analysis guidelines. So similar to elder study, we were not looking at stealing effect, but it emerged as a very strong theme in our study, which is why it became the topic of this paper. So the narratives of early life adversities of several participants revealed an inoculation effect that played a protective role in dealing with stressors in adulthood. These were, this was the focus of our papers. Now, here are some of the narratives of the people. So when we asked them that, how has the adverse experience changed you? Or how has it contributed to you as a person? As you can see, one of the participants replied, I think I'm a really strong person and I think I am who I am because of everything I experienced. Another person shared that I matured quite early, like understanding problems, taking responsibility. Another participant said that their experiences have prepared me for the world and taught me a great deal. So you can see all these examples of people who displayed stealing effect from our study. In the end, we concluded by saying that it is possible for individuals with a history of childhood adversity to not only be resilient, but also be better equipped at handling stressors in adulthood. So resilience may not just help an individual to strive, but also to thrive in the face of adversity. However, later in 2012, Rutter added or elaborated on his research by saying that there are a lot of underlying factors that play an important role in determining the outcomes of any kind of adversity. For example, even with the, sorry, even with the display of uh, stealing effect, there are certain personality traits, dispositional factors, there could be personal agency, which involves a concern to act, a self-reflective style, or a commitment to a relationship. So these factors could play an important role in determining if the person is going to display stealing effect or not. Therefore, future research could possibly investigate such factors to have a better understanding of what influences the development of hardness following experiences of trauma. And something is, that is it, thank you. she'll need uh, to unmute. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh hi. Uh, thank you, Anand. Um, your research has a uh, very deep meaning. Now that we have still four minutes left, maybe you can entertain one or two questions. You can, uh, people can type the question in the chat. So can I ask one question, Anand? What is the most surprising phenomenon that you have noted through this research? And um, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yep. Everyone, please make sure that uh, you're muted. Yeah, I'm muted so sorry. At the right time. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so as I was saying that uh, since we were not looking to study stealing effect, this was an interesting theme that we observed because we were initially just looking at individuals who have been through trauma and how they have coped in the past and looking at their resilience and mental health. And stealing effect was one of the important or themes that emerged. That is why we thought of turning it into a paper. Other things that were interesting were different kinds of protective factors and processes that we observed in the study. Perhaps Anand. Can, would you share with us what is your next immediate project that you plan to work on? 
Yeah, so currently my PhD thesis is not on childhood adversity. I'm actually working with uh, adolescents with a history of self-injurious behaviors and resilience. So I have just begun my PhD at, here in Halifax. So I'm looking to study that in the future. Great. Thank you very much for the time that you're sharing with us, Anand, and all the, all the best to your studies. Now, Thank can so I give you the next paper speaker? Siobhan Colony Hogan. Okay. Just let this go. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Siobhan Connie Hogan. I just set, set my set watch because I'm always going over time. I have to be careful. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you, present my paper, um, the title of which was How Two Journeys, um, the author's journey of change from doing the master's in applied positive psychology and uh, her father's death journey interacted and impacted on each other. So I, I was looking at the questions, how did these two journeys interact and affect each other and how mortality awareness helps us to live life fully, being an important component in uh, optimal living. Um, I've always been drawn to existential positive psychology um, because I really value uh, positive psychology for real life for the hard days, for the ups and downs of, of the real life, for the self-doubting days, for the grieving days. Um, and this has always been my, where I really see the value of positive psychology. Um, it's for the whole of life, not just the bright side. So it's about living life fully to the best of one's ability and the true fulfillment of potential. Um, my father was diagnosed with terminal illness during my first year of, um, of completing a map. Um, I did a, a two-year map and a master's in applied positive psychology. And during the first year, my father was diagnosed with, uh, with terminal cancer and died eight months later. So um, that journey, and meanwhile, I was having my own journey of change through um, doing the... Uh, applied version of the masters um, and it provided a, a real clarity for me um, on to what was truly important in living and in dying. So the aim of the case study was to ascertain that mortality awareness is a vital contributor to growth and, and a healthy perspective. So just to look at the literature first, journey as a common metaphor, um, the abstract concept of life, um, it's often used to help us out of that. It's a psycho, so it provides a psychosocial perspective encompassing um, expectations, goals, mystery, and ourselves as traveler and hero. It provides a perspective on the connection to fellow travelers, our challenges, um, meaning and purpose. Sorry, my son is looking in the window. Would you believe this? I've told him all day not to be looking in the window or be doing anything. So it's Fion, goodbye. Sorry, the map journey is often associated with perspective change. Um, and uh, for me, it certainly was. Uh, I really felt that I had a great perspective change um, and a great positive change at that. Theorists have long regarded the midlife period as a natural time of change. Um, also, uh, death has also been seen as a journey, and um, this has been used as a metaphor throughout time. It helps to minimize the discomfort and the reality of this natural phenomenon um, and is used as a common coping strategy to see death as a journey. Yalom talked about mortality historically haunting us, casting a shadow over our existence, this shadow being a form of death acceptance. In difficult times, we search for meaning and purpose to make sense of the challenges and suffering. I think that can be really seen at the moment in, in you know, the resurge of interest in Frankl's man's search for meaning and all of the, the look, people looking for meaning throughout the pandemic. 
So Frankel's logotherapy and Wong's meaning therapy provide invaluable frameworks for difficult times. And meaning helps us to interpret human suffering and provides methods of transcending it. So the method I used was um, an auto ethnological reflection of how two life journeys interacted and affected each other. Auto or ethnographical ethnography, sorry, I'm very nervous, is the scientific description of peoples and cultures with their customs, habits and mutual differences. Autoethnography is self-observation involving intentional self-reflexivity and reflexivity as described in the Oxford Dictionary is taking into account of itself or of the effect of the personality or presence of the researcher on what is being investigated. So I used hindsight and data from my journal entries and my assignments of my master's in applied positive psychology. As you know, you're doing um, you're journaling all the time as you take on the, the personal uh, the assignments. Um, and I also used uh, my daily social media. Uh, so I post every day um, on, on social media um, and uh, these are all rooted in positive psychology. And um, I create a post every day. So it often reflects on how I'm feeling and thinking myself. So I used all this as data and I reflected on how these experiences supported my belief that mortality awareness helps us to live fully authentically and is an important component of optimal living. So this is just an excerpt of my journal at the time. Um, I, would you just bear with me, I'll read it out. There is nothing like someone you love receiving a sudden terminal illness diagnosis to alter one's perspective on life. Everything shifts on the priority list. It is as if one's vision becomes crystal clear, focusing only on what is truly important. Time takes on a new speed and relevance. Conversations are transformed, words spoken are carefully chosen, and words heard are valued and invested in storage for future treasure. Here is one of the, um, the other type of data that I was using is my social posts. Um, and here's an example of one of them. Um, so as you can see, I just take a quote or post something on a picture um, and I post these every day and I have done for two and a half years. So the discussion, um, well, I would say that, that we have a natural change in perspective as we get older, um, and the theorists will say this. And McAdams talks about it being called a restabilization, where we search for a deeper meaning and another lens to view the anticipated slowing down of life. The change through MAP helped to instill an increased confidence and a calmness and a clarity of mission, and also a lust for life. That helped me to accompany my father on his brave death journey. And it also helped me to be fully, authentically present for him and my family. Each step enhanced through the various stages of awareness, learning, growing, suffering, acceptance and transcendence. So this was just another post that I had about the, our changing perspective. My findings um, outside of the humor, savoring, mindfulness, all of these um, positive psychology interventions that helped, I would say gratitude and meaning played the key roles in, um, in how I thrived through this adversity. Um, I was very grateful from the very start of taking on the master's. I felt very um, grateful for the opportunity to be doing a master's, to be able to be taking a career break and to be able to fully um, committing to the learning. Um, and that didn't, that sense of gratitude was definitely um, increased when my father um, got the diagnosis of terminal illness. If I was working, I wouldn't have been with him the day he got the shocking news and I wouldn't have been able to be with him for all of his treatments, for most of his treatments. And I really feel privileged about that. I also feel very privileged to have been with my family surrounding him in what um, I immediately was able to describe as the most beautiful death. My father was very grateful to me and for my presence there and he valued my help, direction, interpretation and company like never before. The little daily rituals of washing his feet, bringing him his paper, getting him his beloved ice cream, all became so important, providing comfort and stabilization at a vulnerable time. Meaning was very important and it really helped me to thrive through these dark, challenging times as the lessons of positive psychology provided a solid framework to reframe and repurpose the unfolding events and emotions. 
As we confront our own mortality, a clarity appears. We look at the world with a fresh perspective. We stop wasting time on meaningless pursuits and focus on what is important. Only then can we detect our mission. Um, so here's another one of my uh, daily posts. Um, and you don't create your mission in life, you detect it, a quote from Frankel. So I just will conclude that mortality awareness helps us to live fully and authentically and is an important component of optimal living. And I recognize that this is a single case study and is therefore limited, but I believe there's great scope for further research and reflection on this topic. And I thank you all for listening to me and I excuse my nerves and my son. <laughs> thank you. That's great. You are on good time. We have one and a half minutes. Okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'd have to rush it quicker. <laughs> Would you tell us something about your current uh, practice and how this experience affect how you're helping your clients? Yeah, sure. Um, so I just I want to put my window down. Is that okay? Um, so I, as I was saying, I post every day on social media, I set up a business called Sauna Real Life Positivity, and I've written six courses this year. So I'm only one year out of the master's and I have decided that I've made it my mission um, to spread the invaluable teachings of positive psychology um, to everybody and anybody that will listen um, my father didn't didn't appreciate the values of positive psychology or my enthusiasm for positive psychology, but I really do think it really helped him in his death journey as well. So, yeah, everybody and anybody is getting it. So I post every day on social media, on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And um, I'm yeah, just building up writing courses and trying to help as many people as I can that way. That's wonderful. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Siobhan. So we have our next paper guest. Her name is Dr. Via Noah. Hi. I'm also going to share a screen. Okay. So uh, my presentation is called is on positive transformation and the laws of nature from caterpillar to butterfly. Um, I'm a nature therapist. I'm speaking right now from Israel. It's so beautiful to have these connections from different people and different cultures and different communities. But there, it's just beautiful to share a, a mutual essence in wanting to bring healing and good and wholeness to the world. So. I'm with much gratitude uh, that I can share this with you and hear the other presentations, which are, are very touching. Thank you. Um, so basically, this is part of a one second. This isn't moving. Okay. So this is part of uh, my dissertation, my PhD which is a model for therapeutic intervention in nature-based therapies. And the bigger question that we asked was, what are the distinct therapeutic factors or mechanism of change in nature-based therapies and which specific therapeutic effects are perceived to be associated with these factors? Nature-based therapies uh, is an umbrella term for many different therapeutic <clears throat> approaches that work in nature and with nature based on the assumption that our, um, our connection with nature and our relationship with nature is part of our well-being. And it says a lot more, the word for nature means something that's outside of us, but also inside of us. And it means a lot in, in how, how we deal with, with the world and with our life. And nature has a lot to teach us. So um, my research, which was an eight year research, uh, worked with the method of grounded theory mythology. And our data was in-depth interviews with 26 nature brave practitioners from five different countries with various pro professional backgrounds and six field observations. And maybe the first question we wanna ask is why nature? What's so important? We all know that what's so, um, 
um, basic to, to positive and good therapy is the connection between the therapist and the client. So what's so important about nature? What is it about this setting? And what we found is that first and more, more most is that it's a growth oriented setting. So there's something happening around us that's always striving to grow. Everything we see in that kind of setting is striving to grow. It's even, I'll say, a little sad to think that every part of life strives to face its biggest potential. And it's only man that can choose not to accept his greatest potential or not to bring that into life. So when we go back out in nature, we see that's the basic of life is really to, to keep on striving and to grow and to towards the sunlight and to be our better self, our biggest self. It also, the natural setting portrays vitality and it mirrors wholeness with a lot of acceptance. You know, we don't go out in, into nature and say, oh, that tree is, trunk is so fat or so large or those branches are so broken. No, we see it all as part of something that's whole and natural. And it's easier for us to take and accept our wholeness in an atmosphere that's not judgmental like that. And the last um, basic element of working out in nature is that it's an unpredictable, uncontrollable, and constantly changing environment. So for a nature therapist like myself, when I take clients out, I do not know what's gonna happen. That's risky, that's very challenging, but I come with the assumption that whatever happens or whatever we meet is going to be for the best of this client. And I'm going to see it. I'm going to see nature as intervening in that way. And that's something that I'll connect the person to. And sometimes after a while of working like that, that's kind of the way the client will see life as everything is speaking to me and everything is in connection with me. And maybe I should work on my relationships with the world. So although comfort and ease are prized in our culture, acknowledging the unpredictable and uncontrollable reality of life is really necessary to maintain well-being. As said so many times and so beautifully by all the theorists and researchers in second wave positive psychology. Change and destabilization are a constant in the cycle of life. And just like you said um, about the mortality, that's part of life that we now put it away and we don't look at it and we don't see it. That's not so good for our well being. So it's really necessary to understand this in healthy development. COVID 19 has instigated a considerable amount of adversity, vulnerability, and dis ease. We therapists are seeing the aftermath, and it's harsh. People are in, uh, under so much stress and have been scared and don't know what to do. And basically, what this is facing us with is that we really do not have control over this world and sometimes even over our life. So when these aspects of life are perceived as undesirable, then hardships may be denied and avoided deepening the pain and undermining the, the gifts that we can have in these hardships. Without proper guidance on how to navigate hardships in a constructive manner, the meaning embedded in adversity and their potential for development may go overlooked. We are in transition right now. And Professor Brian Swim and Marian Tucker wrote, Evolution moves forward through transitions. The movement from inorganic matter to organic life, for example, or from single-celled organisms to plants and animals, all such transitions come at times of crisis, involve tremendous cost, and result in new forms of creativity. We are in a transition moment, and this is time for people that understand the opportunity embedded to, to say what we have to say. We've done research and worked for so many years on this. This is the time to help people understand 
that we can view this crisis as an invitation for a better life. So maybe we have an opportunity to go from an ego-centered lifestyle to a more eco-centered lifestyle because the earth does not belong to man, but man belongs to the earth. And there are so many theories, whether it's from biology or cosmetology or chemistry or, or, or uh, neuroscience talking about these same ideas. So one example is the system dynamics theory. From the perspective of nature, actualizing the potential of a species or a system depends on three attributes. This is resilience, adaptability, and transformability. And many of the researchers in our field talk about this too, but I'm showing this from a little different perspective, talking about dynamics of nature. This, these are the basics of nature. These are the laws of nature. This is how we grow. This is how we develop better structures that are more adapted. And Dr. Wong brought us the dual systems model based on uh, second wave positive psychology, understanding that growth and full development are attained through acknowledging and expressing both the negative and positive aspects of self and life. Holding such a complexity and paradox of life as a whole. So in this system, the positive conditions and the negative conditions and the positive outcomes, that he shows so beautifully how all these are interconnected in something that goes beyond positive and negative, but the complexity of life. Um, okay. And then there's the theory of positive disintegration, talking also about how disintegration is so much a part of our life and, and helps us to, to gain our full potential. The last model I'm bringing is a model of intentional destabilization that um, I brought with my professor, um, talking about how we can, in therapy, intentionally bring our client to some kind of destabilization in a very, very accepting environment and help him bring that into integration. So I just want to finish with the fact that the current pandemic challenges paradigms that view the humans as an isolated being in a random purposeless universe. We may be at the brim of a shift in consciousness from valuing individualism to embracing interdependence on a vast scale. Peter Raskin called this time the great transition. Joanna Macy, the activist, calls this as the great turning. And if you look at this picture, you can see on the left, this is a close-up of a small leaf. In the middle, it's blood vessels of a human heart. And on the right, of the river network in the Amazon. We are all connected. And by integrating humanistic and existential perspectives with second wave positive psychology based on the research and theories, some of which I just brought today, we have the opportunity to convey a message of meaning that butterflies die as caterpillars to gain wings and fly high. Thank you so much. Wow, this is so rich. Mm. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Noah. Do you, can you share with us your, is there any resistance from people that you encounter with when you share this message? I feel the opposite. I feel people are really seeking to hear this and that they need to hear it. And it has a calming effect. It's like, oh, that's normal and it happens everywhere. And I'm part of nature. And if everything grows like that in nature, then maybe I can be like that too. So it's very calming, I find. And we can meditate with our patients using natural visions or elements and bringing that in, even if we're indoors. And it, it really is, is settling and helpful for many people to gain at these time hope. Very good. Oh, thank you. This is so heartwarming to hear. Mm. Last but not least, let's go on to our last paper um, presenter, Charlotte Evers Salibi. Take it away, Charlotte. Thank you. I am just going to pull up my, oops, what do I do? my screen. 
which now, why can't I find it? Um, strange. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. Technical difficulties. You can go ahead. During this conference okay. for any attendees, uh, if you want to network with any of the speakers or presenters, there is a, on the left-hand side of the feed loop, there is the speaker tab or networking tab. You can click on that. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charcy Evers Salibi, and I just want to extend a warm thank you to Dr. Paul Wong and everyone at IMPM for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm a fashion industry veteran, a trend analyst and futurist, and just last week I completed a Master's of Science in Business for Social Impact and Sustainability from Glasgow, Caledonia, New York College. While these, may, these uh, titles may describe me, it's the loss of my mother at the age of 10 that defines me. But I would never share that as part of my background or experience because we're too uncomfortable with grief and loss. And I've learned that talking about what happened to me can quickly turn into what's wrong with me. The adaptive grief strategy for early mother loss that I present to you today is born of this experience and the hope that mother loss can become part of a young girl's story to share, not to shame. Building from Dr. Paul Wong's work in second wave positive psychology, the research proposes an open-ended grief strategy focused on meaning integration and adaptation. I used a qualitative research methodology based in grounded theory um, that was adapted from my graduate thesis topic, which was Generation X Women and a Diminished Sense of Meaning in Life with the Impact of Toxic Positivity on American Culture. Mouthful. In the United States, our cultural pursuit of happiness under the guise of well-being has created a tyranny of positive thinking. And a cultural narrative that basically implies that negative states such as grief and sorrow are dysfunctions to be alleviated. And this narrative is perpetuated in contemporary therapeutic models that take a medicalized approach and pathologize suffering. Rather than exploring a process to adapt, they focus on an outcome to achieve. This can create unrealistic expectations of resolution, shame around suffering, and neglect to consider the adaptive benefits that can come out of adversity. This focus on happiness and the denial of difficult and authentic emotions has actually made us more vulnerable and less resilient. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed the fragility of our collective mental health. And as Dr. Wong posits, we face a lack of psychological preparedness and coping skills. This is especially concerning for youth. A team of researchers from Penn State approximated that for every 13th COVID-related death, a child loses a parent. An estimated 43,000 children in the United States have lost one parent to COVID-19. This is a 20% increase in parental loss over the typical year. As prior research has shown, children who lose a parent are at greater risk for traumatic prolonged grief, suicide, substance abuse, and poor educational outcomes. But even before COVID, adolescent grief was significant yet it went largely unacknowledged. In the United States, one in 14 children in the U.S. will lose a parent before the age of 18. That means 5.2 million children will be bereaved by the age of 18, and that doubles to 13.2 million under the age of 25. For mother loss in particular, an estimated 330,000 girls under the age of 18 lose their mother annually, and that was before COVID. Today, there are 1.1 million women under the age of 60 who have lost their mothers during childhood and adolescence. Mother loss at this stage is profound. The mother-daughter relationship is an important part of the identity development in girls. And when mother loss occurs at this stage, it becomes their single most defining characteristic. This grief manifests in very specific ways and splits life into two parts creating an old and new definition of self. But studies show that when a girl is able to maintain an ongoing attachment to the mother, it helps integrate this experience of loss. And over time, it can positively guide the process of identity development and even result in new and better understandings of self. But with limited opportunities for discussion around their unique experience of loss, 
Relatedness is essential to forming connection and holding space for these young girls to feel comfortable enough to process and explore their grief. Contemporary therapeutic models focus on overcoming issues, which further stigmatizes pain and suffering and seek to alleviate or suppress symptoms. A more open-ended approach that acknowledges the duality of human nature, however, would allow for the many iterations of pain and suffering throughout one's life and seek to understand, relate, and foster adaptation. This would be most effective, especially for grief and that of a motherless girl whose loss not only becomes part of her identity, but is often the way she derives meaning and keeps her mother present over the course of her life. Given the level of trauma from loss that we've experienced in the COVID-19 pandemic, the 21st century will require a much less linear, more relational approach to grief overall. But this necessitates strategies and grief models that acknowledge the complexity of loss and foster adjustment for the bereaved to the new reality. Loss is a fundamentally transformative event in one's life and a multifaceted personal journey that's as individual as a fingerprint. There's a long arc to grief and when we need to reframe loss as something to stay connected to as opposed to move on from if we are to integrate it into our life story. We also need to emancipate the idea of what therapy needs to be or look like, especially for children who are not willing or able to articulate their suffering in a clinical setting. We need to create environments that foster dialogue more organically. An adolescent girl without a mom is an outlier at a time when fitting in is crucial to her sense of belonging. Clothing at this developmental stage is steeped in meaning beyond style. Gender, identity, conformity, body image, puberty, sexuality. Clothing represents all the things our mothers help us navigate. But for a motherless girl, it also becomes a symbol of who's there and who's not. As a fashion industry veteran, shopping for clothes is like breathing to me. Yet as a woman who lost her mother at the age of 10, some of the most profound moments of grief have come at the significant milestones that are culturally associated with mothers, daughters, and clothing. Shopping for a first bra, prom dress, interview suit, wedding, maternity clothes, sorry, triggered a sense of loss and solitude that rendered me helpless, even within the domain of my own expertise. In all of her glory is an adaptive grief strategy, using the shared experience of shopping and clothing as a medium to help motherless young women navigate these significant milestones and facilitate an exploration of feelings in a relatable and informal way. Studies show that experiential treatments as opposed to evaluative can lead to better adjustment after a traumatic event. And this approach would lend itself to addressing life skills well beyond styling. It would provide a much needed emotional support from a team of motherless volunteers and mentors and create a meaningful way to stay connected to their mothers. As an open-ended strategy it would also meet the ever-changing needs and iterations of grief and could potentially serve as a method for further longitudinal research to investigate the impact of maternal loss on identity across a lifespan. In all our glory is a term often used to describe the presence of a beautifully dressed woman and is loosely defined as full splendor and power, but it also refers to being completely naked. In tandem, I believe it embodies the range and depth of the mother's love from our most fragile and vulnerable state to our most empowered and celebrated. From birth to adulthood, no one accepts, loves, and understands the duality of who we are more than our mothers. Thank you. Wow, this is very profound. We thank you for all the paper submiss submitters. You, you guys are all winners for this Maddie Scholarship Award. Dr. Maddie will be very pleased to hear all these, um, though he's not with us today. But we thank you for sharing your experience. I hope that when you go to the world, right now with your passion with your experience painful or joyful with what you believe in you will change the world one step at a time we thank you so much thank you all the participants for attending and we shall connect bye-bye
Too late to start again. What breaks your heart? 